You're listening to Defective Detective, a podcast about when the world's a mess, when your brain's a mess, when your body's a mess, and, and technology somehow. Recording. I'm definitely recording right now. I just noticed it says this space remaining for recording. So if you want to talk for 207 hours, we can do this shit. I mean, we definitely can. That last phone call was eight hours long. So... Yeah, we're wild. We we definitely are. Do you want me to introduce you? Or do you want to say something about you? Or should we just not even acknowledge that there's another person with another voice? And then make the listener figure out if it's you just projecting a different voice? Yeah. Or put an it, auto-tuner on it or something? No, what if I just coded myself another person in my life? That would be machine learning. Very we're not there. We're not there. <laughs> A lot of people think that AI can just do this wild shit that it can't. We're not there. Advances have been made. We do not have the technology. Anyways, I was going to say about you is this is Sarah. Ta-da! She's my sister. I'm the sister. And we both have chronic illness. Which... (laughs) So exciting. Is it okay that I say that you have celiac? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Do you want to be known as Sarah or would you rather have another name? I think anyone should be able to change their name if they want. Oh, yeah. It shouldn't just be for trans people. Or people should be able to just try on other names. I was going by Fable in my psychedelic trips. Yeah. I'm trying to think now of the last podcast that I listened to and I don't think you introduced yourself on it. At least I don't remember so a lot of podcasts, they have this beginning thing that happens behind while the music is playing where it will be like, you're listening to Defective Detective. And then it'll say a little sentence about what it is. And oh, I okay. forgot to put that in. Well, OK, that's a lie. I <laughs> let me start over. <laughs> I remembered that I didn't have it when I was at the very end of editing which meant oh. that I already had the transcript done with the timestamps of every single oh, section. No. So yeah. if I would have added that at the beginning, I would have had to redo every single timestamp in the transcript. Yeah, no. And I was no, like, no, not worth. I think I would rather fall off a cliff because it took me three days oh my to God. edit that. Originally, the audio recording which ours will probably be off by this even more if I don't know if we decide that we want to cut a lot of this chattering stuff. Although I like the chatter. I also like chatter. It was an hour and 42 minutes long and I cut it to an hour 15. That sounds about right, yeah. So I think the first night that I was editing it, I was editing it for I think five hours and I got through 20 or 30 minutes. Oh and God. I was, I'm never going to be able to finish this. I'm never going to be able to have a podcast. And then I look back and I have now had a podcast for almost two years and I've only put out four episodes, but I don't care because it's getting easier now to edit. I think the next night I was editing faster, but it takes time. It takes the time it takes. Yeah. I mean, that's the hard part about creating anything is it goes by so quickly when you're actually in the creating process. But then as soon as you get to the extra nitty gritty work, the editing and then the transcripting and all of this other stuff. Yeah. That's when you're like, I have to power through like the Kool-Aid man and just break through the wall. Yeah. It's the 20 thing. I just imagined you as the Kool-Aid man. What color of Kool-Aid is my sister? Oh, my God. I'm that terrible interviewer at a tech company. <laughs> so tell me your five year plan and what color of Kool-Aid you would be. Have I ever told and you? No. To, uh, oh, no. my God. There was, was a guy say... at my old company who would ask people what flavor of Jolly Rancher they would be. Oh, my God. And that is so inappropriate, especially considering gender. Note to listeners, though, I do not look like the Kool-Aid man. I mean, um, you could have just let them have that. The, I mean, I guess I could have. <laughs> the smile is the same, though. Oh, yeah. I can, I can confirm. <laughs> Yes, and I do have a habit of breaking things, so not on purpose, of course, but mean well, that's what matters. Exactly. Yep. 
plus life of the party. So, you know, we have now gone so far that I don't remember what we were talking about. That brought up the I Kool-Aid don't band. remember either. This is what happens to us, though, and why we end up on eight hour long phone calls. <laughs> but it doesn't feel like eight hours until we actually look at a clock. We were talking and... about the end of projects. Oh, yes. Okay. One of the things that happens to a lot of founders is that they will focus on that smaller stuff to the detriment of the bigger, meatier things that I can't believe I just said meteor. And then when I said it again, it sounded like meteor. And I was like, yeah, oh, my God. I, thought. I was like, a meteor sounds better. Okay, the meteor things <laughs> have to happen. The project that I was consulting on, I suggested that maybe they have a podcast. It was the same idea as this podcast because I'm not that original, right? That they could have a podcast where they interview users for the company and get those stories out there Mm -hmm. you're kind of hedging your bets making it so that even if you fail you still publicized the issue yeah made something that's why i think that doing things in a content first way is just a better way to build a company now not for every industry or every founder or every product but in a lot of ways i think there's so many advantages to having to make content first because If you can make TikToks or podcasts or write a book or whatever that's in the realm of where the product is. I was mentioning to you earlier that Rob Fitzpatrick wrote a book about writing useful books. One, the book was super useful about writing useful books. I understand how meta this is sounding. (laughs) Maybe one or two places in the entire book where he mentioned that they had a product to do this. So because of SEO, a lot of companies are making content that's just marketing content and it's garbage. Yeah. And so they're not ranking that highly on SEO. Google has now changed. They're always updating how their SEO works. And then everybody has the mad shuffle to figure out how to get their things to list high again. Right? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Ridiculous. How much search and social shapes what we find and what we're exposed to. Just that podcast to put their user voices out in the world because I think that that's really transparent. What ended up happening is the person who I suggested that to, instead of just wanting to do a podcast in the easiest way possible, like I bought the music for this podcast off from a website so that I would have the copyright to it. So I wasn't going to try to make my own podcast music. I had debated asking my ex, C, about doing it. It's just so easy. You could just buy a clip off from this website. And instead, this person I had suggested it to decided to send out an email to this email list group to try to find someone to make music for the podcast. This is a distraction. Yeah. It's a really fine balance. Because sometimes you're putting extra details into things, helps your product stand out and keeps you engaged. And then there's getting so into the branding marketing side of things that you're not really paying attention to the product you're building or the impact that you're having. Right? Yeah. Yeah. On the details. Yeah, exactly. I think VC, venture capital. Uh Uh-oh. I'm sad because Adobe bought Figma. Oh, yeah. Yep. I'm happy that Figma exists. I think it's a brilliant product. I think the fact that they could make a native-like app in the browser is amazing. It gives a lot of support. I would only build a product that's a web product. I would not build separate native mobile apps. That's where we're at with software as an industry, right? Yep. Well, and you want it to be accessible to as many people as possible. Yeah. Which also means that you really do have to focus on it being like a progressive web app, which means that the performance of the app is improved because people could be using your app and not have the best network access or not be on Wi-Fi. You have to keep that in mind when you're building things. Depends on what your user base is. And how you're figuring out who those people are. I don't even like the word user. And I don't like the term target audience. 
one time a long time ago, I found replacements for both of those, and I can't remember what either of them are. So even though I found language that I felt was better, I didn't write it down anywhere or remember it. But I hate that it's Target because that sounds violent. And it sounds like you're manipulating people. So why not just audience? So an audience is technically a one-way relationship, but they're just listening to you. A community would be the people that are in that group are interacting with each other. A community yeah. might revolve around a leader or a product or whatever. The whole strength of a community is that the people that are in it are interacting with each other. So I think user-driven design needs to be more like a community and not an audience. But I don't know. And there's probably a bunch of other terms that I'm not even remembering right now. So the whole point is <laughs> the worst lead up I've ever done. Maybe we should actually judge those and, and write them down somewhere at some point. Because sometimes it takes me 15 minutes to say something that could have taken 30 seconds. And I don't even know why. I mean, it's a slow buildup. <laughs> it's not like Hollywood where it's explosions Michael Bay in your face, you know. It's a slow yeah. burn. So... <laughs> You were, what was it that I asked you earlier today for us to do tonight on this? Do you remember? <laughs> yes. Ask the person who has a very poor memory to remember oh, something I'm that sorry, happened dude. today. No, I... Uh, you were going to ask me questions. Yes. I believe. Yes. And the reason for that is because the whole idea of this podcast, which I have not executed well on, that's where the friction's coming from. That's where the buildup's coming from. It's because I yeah. just don't want to face that I've failed at a bunch of things. That I've tried to do way too many things at the same time. But at the same time, I'm really happy that I did a bunch of things together because now I have all these skills. It's complicated. Anywho, user interviewing. The Indie Hackers podcast is Cortland Allen interviewing successful bootstrapped founders Mm -hmm. And then there's the Indie Hackers website, which is the product that Cortland built. What he was doing with the podcast was to showcase successful users from the product. Okay. That makes sense. I don't really go on the Indie Hackers website that much. Uh, so wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold I used on. to. So you're, <laughs> like, so you're like, this guy, he makes this podcast to show the users using his product well but i don't really go on the website technically technically the people that are on the podcast don't have to be indie hackers users they just have to be bootstrapped founders okay you know the spotify year in review or spotify unwrapped or whatever i sure. don't have spotify anymore because i switched title because the joe rogan shit and i'm not paying artists and blah 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 i've never used it so we're in a good boat anyway well sorry let me, ex We're doing well Let me here. explain this product to you. Spotify does this thing at the end of the year called Spotify Unwrapped. And I've always wanted to do a version of it for Goodreads, which I want to call Goodreads Uncovered. Oh, okay. But it's, Ooh. you know, one of my 10,000 ideas. Sounds, sounds about right. Yes. In that data, the podcast page where it told me how much I listened to different podcasts was just a bunch of pictures of the Indie Hackers cover because I listened to every single fucking episode of that podcast. Oh. Was it a Netflix binge sort of a thing or? I don't know. I just wanted to learn everything that I could about it. And I don't listen to podcasts yeah. as much now, which is funny because I'm working on mine. I think for a long time, I was focused on taking in a lot of information. And it's a fine balance between taking in information and learning stuff and then creating things. If I were to t think about what my balance is, I'm way more towards the learning side. I mean, doing is also learning, right? Yes, correct. If you make a website, you learn while you're doing it. I tend to think too far into the future. So I'll be thinking out, what are all the possibilities if I built this in five years or something? Yeah. Instead of what are all the things that I need to execute in the next month? Basically, you need to be mentally flexible enough as a founder to have a ton of different interests across a bunch of different markets because the main thing that makes a company successful is timing. It's whether or not all of these things exist in the world that would support the business happening at the exact moment. Yeah. So you have to be able to pay attention to pretty much everything. Then you have to be able to switch back and forth between learning and doing. To make things it's, more complicated. And you be able to switch between different time frames. 
Yeah. You have to be able to look at a problem in terms of a day, a month, six months, five years, whatever. What Indie Hackers inspired me to do is to want to do the same thing for disabled people that he did for Bootstrap Founders. So I picked out two questions today that I think are good user questions to start with. What I have been thinking about, and I'm so curious to hear your thoughts, Oh, is basically just coming up with different problems that chronically ill or disabled or neurodivergent or whatever people have, mm -hmm. and then bringing them on the podcast to interview them about that problem, and then taking the transcript of that interview and just making it available for everyone. The reason why I want to do this is because my goal is not... <laughs> I'm just going to say it. My goal is not to be successful. <laughs> Yes. I don't really care about me. Aim high. <laughs> I I just want I just want to admit it. I would like to make enough money to support myself and to build creative things and to explore stuff. I have never, I don't even think for a moment, wanted to make a billion dollar company. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I definitely understand that. There are different types of success it also depends on your definition of what success really means but you no know, i wrote I an mean, article about that on my blog i knew it that's why tangent no no tangent <laughs> we don't have to talk us. about that now um, you know when you're like sister is used to having her <laughs> this will be an hour long that we're gonna have to cut out and make another podcast since we are sisters and we are alike in some ways we both are the types that don't care about status or monetary things were more about improving the lives of people we care about and love and who are marginalized and getting that information out there because in small part to social media which again is a double-edged sword it is a way for marginalized people to get their voice out there i think making a podcast like this is a great idea because it's another source to get people's voices out there and heard and hopefully heard by people who are making billion dollar projects and going hey this is something we didn't consider when making our product yeah and we both so. know that disabled people are rarely considered it's frustrating how many disabled people there are exactly um, and there are other podcasts which showcase disabled people's stories it's not I want to completely remove the story that's happening, but I think the thing that is missing is taking parts of these different stories and doing the user research to isolate a problem that a group of disabled people are having and to put that information out there into the world in an easy-to-use format. The reason why I want to do that is because I want to help disabled people become creators and become founders or whatever else other thing that they want to do to make content or to make products for disabled people because that's what we need. Yeah. And so I think... And again... Oh, go ahead. That's my thought is to put out these interviews in a way where they're like, the problems that come up to sort them together. So that people just have some of that user research done. Yeah. So even if my product fails, it doesn't matter because I'm trying to help other people <laughs> build product. Again, what's your definition of success? Which there is a book on that my sister has read that we aren't going to talk about right now. But no, <laughs> me talk about it in the future. There's an article I wrote on my oh, blog. No an article oh about my definition of success i don't remember what it says that i wrote but it. it's on the blog so yes. you should go check it out yeah whatever if one person subscribed to my blog anyways you can get more that's true you know that book i was talking to you about maybe why greatness can't be planned i'm obsessed with this book the premise of the book is that all great innovation happens because people didn't even have an objective and they just explored shit that was interesting to them. And then by doing that, they left stepping stones for other people 
to explore and create more things. So to me, I think the definition of success is influence on others. That's a good way to think about it. And empowering them. Yeah. When you start to interview people, you start to find out they have similar experiences and this just reflects back onto the isolation that you can feel when you're disabled. Yeah. Which again, social media does help with that. Connecting with people that you don't physically have in your life or community. And finding, oh wow, there's someone else who has had an experience like mine. And then you start to see trends outside of your community in the world. And then that's what you have to latch on to to try to make change. So I just wanted to bring up that one point about isolation. So Yeah, that's the point of forming community, right? It's so yep. you don't have that isolation, so that you have a sense of belonging. Today, you know how I was like, hey, I need to take a nap first. But then, of course, I went on Twitter and <laughs> I still took a nap. I did a yoga need your nap. Oh, I was postponing doing that. By being on Twitter and Brian Bennis from No End In Sight had retweeted somebody asking about a workstation set up where they were laying down. Oh, okay. And so I went and dug up an old tweet where I had my couch desk set up and then I yep. also shared a picture of my pillow office and I sent that to them. And somebody else had replied, and they had the same little lap desk that I have that I love, but for some reason haven't used in a while, probably because I just forgot it existed because I <laughs> folded it up and put it to the side of my chair. And so yeah. that means it's gone. Um, yep. Yep. <laughs> oh my God, we have the same desk. And then the person who had written the original request, it turned out they were in Madison. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so then we followed each other. More or less, whenever anybody follows me on Twitter and it's another disabled person, I follow them back. Yeah, that's that's what I do it too. I actually had a similar experience like that too uh, with someone who is disabled, but also a BTS fan. Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> Okay, Sarah, if we're going to have a podcast together and you're going to be yes, on here regu true. regularly, we're going to talk about BTS. It's just going to happen. It's part of who you are. I accept it, is. it. Yes. I don't think you I'm definitely have... not ashamed of it. I'll tell you that. I don't much. think you need to apologize. Okay. Thank you for accepting. You have found a community me. where I you have. feel belonging. This is true. This person is super awesome, really sweet, just randomly responded to one of my tweets, and then I found out that they were high risk. So I found them through BTS. Then I found out that they also had high risk, chronically ill. We started just chatting back and forth, and now we both follow each other, and it's a mutual support. Oh, they oh they posted. I gotta like it. I gotta like it. And it's just another person out there that you can connect to that you don't feel so isolated. So it's nice. Yeah, I think if there is. An issue we're going to have to confront in the near future, it's isolation. Yep. It's figuring out how to actually like, do mutual aid and be in community with other people without needing to rely on in-person events and getting to know your neighbors and things like that. We've talked about this. I'm not going to talk to my neighbors. Nobody is wearing a mask. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's literally unsafe for me to even just stop and talk to them within a short distance. I know I'm wearing an N95 when I walk Pepper, but it's still like... And there's children running around everywhere in my yeah. buildings. I feel like a different person physically when I'm out in the world. Other people don't seem real to me. They seem like objects that I have to avoid yeah. instead of potential points of connection. The only way that I think that I'm going to feel belonging outside of our relationship, which is awesome, is online. I don't see another way to do it. Yeah. I've noticed, especially when I go outside, I feel very similar to that. I also have a sense of, this is going to be funny too, but I have a sense that I'm the old 
neighbor from Dennis the Menace where I'm like, get off my lawn. Because the kids are running around without masks on and stuff. Yeah. And parents are walking the kids outside. And I'm trying not to be. I feel like a curmudgeon. Be... Yes. Yep. And I'm trying not to be hostile so i'll wave and stuff and they'll keep going and they won't approach me which is good there's definitely that separation where i'm not the neighbor from dennis the menace but unfortunately covid has forced me to put up that front literally put up a fence yeah i have a fence up wait what? so you put up a fence around your uh... no i'm sa- metaphorically oh okay <laughs> You're always imagining this giant fence around your patio. No. Wow, this really works. This <laughs> metaphor works because Dennis the Menace has a huge fence. Oh, I can't fence. remember Dennis the Menace because yeah, media that's true. it's also a black and white from like the 1940s or 50s. Oh, or something. well, then I can't blame myself at all. They had it on Nickelodeon with Lassie and Leave It to Beaver and stuff. It sounds familiar. I just can't recall. So I feel like a curmudgeon. I yes. also call myself a COVID Grinch. It's not just the kids running around and people being on your lawns. A friend of mine texted me yesterday, former friend, I should say. Then I feel bad saying former friend because I didn't exactly tell everyone that I didn't want to be friends with them anymore because it was really fucking hard. I just kind of hoped that people would assume that since I wasn't responding to anyone's text messages that they would just go away. We would just drift apart and I wouldn't have to have a painful conversation about ending friendships with every single friend that I had. These are friends of mine who have been even less safe than other people. Yeah, we're going to go to the Willie Street Fair that's happening outside my place right now. The thing that I told you is stressing me out because there's yeah. so many people outside. They want to walk Pepper. It's really hard. I'm just like, okay, that person's crossing the street down there. And this person is standing here smoking a cigarette. I kind of want to avoid them. It's just a lot of cognitive effort to survive. Yep. I understand why people have decided to have a pre-tendemic and just pretend this shit's over. Because it's easier. It's just easier for them. Which, of course, made it harder for the rest of us. And I just don't see how I could have relationships with people When every time that they're making the decision to go out maskless and go to the bars and travel and go to super spreader events and whatever the fuck else they want to do, that they are excluding me from the world. How can I have a fucking relationship with them? I know that this is going to sound really dramatic because it's always dramatic whenever somebody brings up the Holocaust is I feel like my friends took me to the train station and put me on a train and they were like, sorry, you can't stay. And they're waving at me while I'm on the train to go to the camp while they're all partying at the train station. I know that sounds overly dramatic because I can stay home all of the time. I can avoid necessary medical care and dental and all these other things. And I'll probably survive this. But I'm going to be surviving for a life with physical isolation. I don't think that's far off, honestly, that metaphor, because if you really It doesn't feel it, like it, considering what's happening to people. Yeah. Again, no offense to any listeners for this, but literally the people who are isolating right now have the privilege to do that. If you look at the Holocaust, and I'm not a professional historian, the people who had a much better life had privileges to escape or to hide and had the connections to do that. The marginalized and the poor did not. They were the easiest to target and round up. And even Anne Frank, and please don't quote me on this, her father owned a printing um, and had many employees. Those employees helped keep them hidden because they hid above the print shop. And that's how they survived for so long. People who have the privilege to isolate and have the resources have a much higher likelihood of surviving, whereas the other people have been rounded up and sent off, and then they disappear. Yeah. They disappear. Yeah. That's exactly what's happening right now with these people is if they're getting sick with long COVID or other health conditions, they disappear, and you forget about them. The deaths, you forget about them until... You're reminded, usually by 
some kind of physical metaphor. I'll speak from personal experience. And we're kind of getting off tangent, but I think it's... No, this is good. That when I was in Washington, D.C., I went to the Holocaust Museum. I don't know anyone personally who survived the Holocaust, but I am a history minor, so I've read quite a bit about it. And it didn't really hit me the number of people who had died or had been affected until I started to see physical artifacts i remember there was a pile of shoes and all different type little kid shoes men's shoes women's shoes some of them were saved and they were kind of piled up then you see the picture behind it of mountain of shoes that's when you really get hit in the gut and think each one of those pairs of shoes belong to a human being the enormity of it is something that we definitely take for granted. I know they tried to do something similar with COVID deaths. I think they put out like either shoes or flags. I can't remember somewhere in Washington, D.C., closer to the beginning of the pandemic. They did the same thing. To see one flag planted is just one. But then to zoom out and see a million flags, it's just mind boggling. And that's when you really get punched in the gut as to the effect of the pandemic on people. And survivors, too. So I think it's very important not to forget that or ignore that, as some people are unfortunately choosing to do. That's the thing about data, is that we do respond so much more to one person's story than we do to figures. We can't conceptualize over a million people dying. It's far higher than that because a lot of deaths haven't been attributed to COVID even though they are from COVID. Yeah, I agree. I think the worst atrocities in human history have always been connected to a group of people being dehumanized and then usually segregated from everybody else. If you compare what's happening with COVID to what happened with the Holocaust, is I don't know how many German citizens really knew what was happening at concentration camps. And was up close to that's a central part of fascism working is that a lot of people are removed from having to see that suffering. That's part of the rationale for segregating people. I try not to use segregation because I don't know if that's race specific, but the history of institutionalization is the same thing. They're all under the same isolate, separate people. Yeah. When I think about it in terms of COVID, it's the people who work at hospitals have gone through so much stress that doctors have taken their own lives. It's editing cake to say that I phrased this wrong. I should have said died by suicide because people don't commit suicide or take their own lives. Yeah. And they didn't have enough room for bodies to go. They had bands with bodies happening in New York City. People like us, I haven't been exposed to the suffering of COVID. Do you know what I'm saying? Yep. I know people who've had it. I know people who've had long COVID. I haven't seen anyone on a ventilator. Yeah. I'm not right up there with it. I think because of having chronic illness, because of having issues with so many of my organs over the years, I think that for those of us who have that kind of relationship with our body where we haven't been able to depend on our body or we've had really difficult health things to go through, that it just feels more real. I don't have to see someone on a ventilator to know that people are suffering and to want to do something about it. It's like they put those graphic pictures of lung cancer on cigarette cartons in order to like deter people from smoking. Yep. If you put a picture of a person on a ventilator on the door of a bar, would people not go into the bar? How do you actually make this real enough to other people that they want to change their choices? Then there's this part of me that just understands why are they making these choices? Because it sucks to be alone all the time. Yeah. It sucks to give up all the access and things that you had in your life. But all of us could have the ability to go out there and exist in the world 
if we had mask mandates, if they were giving out N95 masks to people, but the government's not going to do either of those things. So now it is on us to figure this stuff out. That's why I wanted to start the user interviewing with COVID-related things. Even though I want to expand it to all sorts of other issues, it's impacting our community in such a... I don't even know how to explain the grief and losing all of those relationships in such a short amount of time. You know what I'm saying? I do. I think a big problem with social media, even though it's great, it has many benefits, again, double-edged sword, is that people now are to the point where they don't believe what they see on social media, even to the effect of if you did put up a poster of someone on a ventilator, would they? I think there's a third of people, at least in America, I don't think that we're going to be able to make much of an impact Yeah, on the way that they view things because... They're hardcore, make America great, mag, mag, people, and they don't believe in vaccinations and science and things like that. I don't see what we can do about them. Yeah. And that's a third of people. Yeah. Even to the point where if something does happen, there is a loss or a death. If they're vaccinated, oh, the vaccine did it. Uh, They're going to do whatever they can in their power to continue to be correct in their mind. Yeah, Um, because otherwise they have to face cognitive dissonance and lose their belonging. Yeah, and that won't happen. That didn't happen to the point where there were stories of people who were in disbelief that they were dying. I think it can happen for some people. I listened to a memoir. I can't remember the name of it. (laughs) (laughs) I can't remember the name of the books that I've read. The guy in it was a white supremacist, was raised a white supremacist, and then went to college and got exposed to these other people. And by the end of everything, he was no longer a white supremacist, but he had to lose. And he had done a considerable amount of harm in that time. I have some complicated feelings about the fact that, you know, as a white man, he's now a professor. He changed his name and is just living his life. At the same time, I think we need to give people paths out of being radicalized at that level. Otherwise, it's going to be even harder. (laughs) I don't know what to do with all of that. But that's just the third of people. There's a third of people who are very high science and community minded that are still taking COVID precaution. And then there's a third of people in the middle that are a mix of a bunch of different things and are kind of following the crowd and probably changing their mind frequently. I think my prognosis or prediction is that these groups will become more static and more defined over time and will start to develop language around it. There's COVID shielders or there's COVID cautious. Yeah, I think we're just going to get more defined language around what some of these things mean. I think until we have cognitive shortcuts for what people's behavior is, we're going to need to figure out ways to share our COVID choices with other people. I don't think that this level of physical isolation is going to work long term. There's even disabled people are giving up on doing any precautions. There needs to be another option there where it isn't, oh, I'm going to give up completely and just start going everywhere maskless and not try at all versus having to be indefinitely isolated and not around anyone. That's what public health did. They put that division in place because we could have kept mask mandates and then everybody would have had a standard of behavior. Instead, they decided that divisiveness was a good idea. Yep. They shifted all the they shifted all the, all the animosity on, yeah, to disabled and marginalized. It's Instead correct. of judging public health, you'll see somebody in a mask and harass them. Yeah. Because they don't want to be confronted with reality. Yeah. To the point now where I saw a post of I think it was the New York Metro, the MTA. Yeah, so the MTA. They had started the pandemic with 
these yellow posters of how to wear a mask properly. Yeah. They were really cute and effective and were great. And then all of a sudden, a couple weeks ago, they did an about face to make fun of their own poster. I saw it. It had four and, faces on it, right? And like, yeah, one, of, yeah. one of them was a person wearing a mask under their nose. Was, the mask covered their face and they were great. And then the next one was covered just their nose. And it was okay. And another one was underneath their nose. And their black counts. The last one didn't have any mask on at all. You do you. And yeah. it's like, what? Yeah. Making complete fun of their own poster and message from earlier in the pandemic. Of course, this just caused mass confusion then because it's more misinformation out there. Just unbelievable that this government in general does this to their own programs and messaging. It just keeps muddying the water even more and more. It was wild. It, for me to tell somebody the reason why I don't like Democrats the other day is because they've left us to die and be isolated. And for just that person responded with, well, even the Democrats are going to pick the economy. They didn't think about it until after. It's not better for the economy to do this. That no, is a not. bold face lie because it's not better for the economy for 4 million people to have long COVID and be unable to work. Yeah. It is not better for the economy for those people to then have to crowdfund medical necessities and help from everybody else in their life, basically bringing down the wealth of the 99%. Because we have to rely on other people. It's only yeah. wealthy people, extremely wealthy people, or somewhat yeah. wealthy people that can just rely on themselves because they have so much fucking money. It's not better for the economy because a third of people are still deciding to stay home because there's no mask band-aids. Yeah. What would have been better for the economy is to improve ventilation in all public spaces that are indoors and to have mass banding. If we would yep. have had those two things, less people would be getting disabled, less people would be getting sick and missing work or pulling their kids out of school. Online learning is not worse for kids than them having COVID multiple times. Yeah. We all know this. Anybody who's living in reality is aware of this. Some people have accepted it because they're like, I just can't do anything about it. So I'm not going to wear a mask and I'm just going to do what everybody else is doing. The ambivalent people. But there's a third of us that are like, fuck no. This can't. This is. Yeah. You can't gaslight all of us. The reason why it's advantageous for government to make these choices isn't because it's better for the economy isn't because it's better for workers. It's because it's better as we confront the climate crisis. Because the more that they can get people used to dividing themselves into different groups and only caring about what happens to their group, the easier it will be for government to not take responsibility for all of the people that are going to die everywhere in the world. I know that just got so dark, <laughs> but yeah. it's true. Look what's happening in Pakistan right now. While our media isn't covering it, people are going on vacation and taking trips and going out to bars and partying and shit like it's 2019. Yep. That's what the government wanted. It wanted to reinforce privilege and reinforce comfort at the expense of lives. And it worked. It worked. It worked with a lot of people. It did. That's it for part one of this episode, but there'll be two more parts. See you later, defective detectives. Bye.